All right, now we're joined by Gail Tarleton, who's running for re-election to the State House of Representatives position two. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Well, good evening. I am really pleased to announce that I filed for my position as State Representative for the 36th District, position two today. I am running for re-election to continue to fight the fight on two particular fronts for uh, the coming two years I feel will be pivotal in how we handle the funding for all education. Now that we have put the pieces in place for K-12, early learning, we need to do the same for higher education. And so I am going to work on behalf of my constituents and all of the state to figure out how we make sure we have stable, predictable funding for the higher education system in this state as we grow to 10 million people. The second priority that I have it has been a priority for all 10 years I've been in public life. Uh, at the state legislature, I've been laying the foundation for work that I will be doing uh, for the next two years, and that is to figure out the path to a clean energy economy for this state. We can fight a lot about the way to get there, but what we can't fight about is that we must get there. It is going to take a dedicated effort on many fronts, working bipartisan, both chambers, across the state, to figure out how we get a clean energy grid by 2045 or 2050, and I have been working on that, and how we get the transportation sector cleaned up so that it is not the major carbon emissions source in this state. Uh, those are the two reasons I'm running for re-election to continue to serve the people, and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Great, thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions that we're asking all candidates for legislature. They're right in front of you. If you want to turn them over, should I look at them? You may, and uh, read along as we read them aloud. These are two-minute answers. And Sarah, will you do number one? Certainly. What tax reforms are realistic in the next legislative session to address Washington State's regressive tax code, and what is your suggested strategy for achieving them? Long term, what in your mind is the ideal tax structure for Washington State? Thanks for asking this question. We have only two minutes to, to talk about <laughs> perhaps the central issue of our time. Uh, beyond the clean energy moves that we must make, we must completely change the way we think about funding the needs of a modern state. And that is why I'm going to focus on how we fund higher ed. That's why I'm gonna focus on how we get to a clean energy economy because those are the two areas where we can achieve a common set of objectives around how we're going to pay for it. And that's what takes us into the conversation of what is a realistic path to change the tax code of Washington State. You can't start by saying, I want a new tax. You must start by saying, what do you want to have be the outcome for this state to serve us for the next 50 years? My objective is to help have the conversation about what the higher ed system needs to look like 10 years from now, when we are moving towards having 8 million people in this state. Now we're at 7.5 million. Within 25 years, we'll be up to 10 million people, given the rate of migration into this state. So we talk about higher education opportunities. We already have more than 500,000 students in the higher ed system within a very short period of time will be close to a million. The clean energy economy is what will help this state move towards a different tax structure. My objective is to do the following. Adopt cor corporate and personal income tax, flat rate that is calculated based on how many dollars you pay to the federal government. Eliminate the B&O tax because that is on gross revenues. We can tax profits and make much more money. I want to reduce the property tax that is taken by the state and, in, and reduce the sales tax. And that is the two minute version. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Clayton, number two. <clears throat> what can and will you do in the legislature to help cities like Seattle address the related crises of homelessness and high housing costs? 
that's a very relevant, immediate issue in front of this city, in front of the region, uh, Puget Sound, and in front of the state. And none of us should take for granted that there is only one solution. And none of us should also take for granted that the path to getting people into housing is an easy path because it is not. I just spent the uh, afternoon with Fair Start uh, talking to them about all of the programs that they have implemented to help those who are homeless get into stable housing and into job training programs around this city uh, with, the, with the restaurant industry. Uh, they're helping 300 to 400 people a year. Uh, the state has invested $838 million since January 2016 in addressing the homelessness and affordable housing crisis in the city of Seattle. That is just in the city of Seattle. And that's from the Housing Finance Commission. We support efforts in the city of Seattle, in Everett, in Tacoma, in Vancouver, Washington, in Spokane, all of which are growing cities who have a continuing need for affordable housing and homelessness support services as well as housing for the for the homeless. I personally believe that we have to build housing and stop thinking that it's okay to have people in tents. It is not okay. I have been watched I've been living in the city for almost 25 years. I have been watching this emerge as an okay approach to getting people into shelter. It's not. They must have housing. And there are many groups around this city that are doing their very best to get there. We need a partnership with them. Uh, many community members and transit supporters are proposing the west of 15th 10 alignment for rail to Ballard. Sound Transit has indicated they will need additional funding to make this possible. Is this something you would support? More broadly, do you support finding new revenues to accelerate ST3 project delivery? So I will say yes, yes, yes. I support the tunnel alignment. I travel on that corridor virtually every single day, either walking or driving or by bus. And that corridor is not gonna be able to be used if we have tra trains on it. It's just not gonna happen. Uh, so I support the tunnel alignment. Uh, I would support and I will work in the legislature if we need to do that to get Sound Transit more money. If they need that more money for the tunnel, I don't know when we will need to initiate that I, because I don't know if Sound Transit has done the planning, the real planning for what the financial impacts are of putting a tunnel in there. They, they probably are in the process of doing some analysis. And then finally, uh, I have committed with my colleagues in Tacoma and Everett and on the entire spine, that we will do everything we can every year to figure out how to get more money into passenger rail along the corridor of the west, western part of Puget Sound because the longer it takes, the worse it's gonna get. And I am very worried about the acquisition of properties that need to happen now so that we have not already built things in the path that the quarters have to travel in. So uh, faster project delivery is a, not only a worthwhile objective, it really should be a strategy with Sound Transit and with the other uh, transit authorities around Puget Sound. So I will, I will be an advocate. I've been on the Transportation Committee every year since I've been in the legislature. I have worked to get bus transit paid for and Sound Transit paid for and high-speed rail investigated and paid for, I will do my very best on this as well. Nicole, sure. Uh, despite the passage of recent education funding bills, Seattle Public Schools remain under, underfunded. What can you, what can and will you do to address this? This is a truly vexing problem for all of us. And part of the difficulty is that the Seattle Public Schools are growing along with the population growth in the city of Seattle. Uh, and the needs of the students grow, not proportionately, but disproportionately, depending on where those students are living, where their parents are, whether they have a job, uh, where the school district is in evaluating the needs of individual students within each school. 
So my colleagues and I, we have 18 legislators who represent either all of Seattle or part of Seattle. So we have a very strong delegation in Olympia. And we're gonna lose some of those to retirement, but we're gonna get very strong Democrats, I am confident. The, my colleagues and I have said, we will focus on mental health counselors, we will focus on uh, the special needs uh, learning programs, uh, bilingual and translation uh, services for the students, as well as working with the, sit, the school board, and we meet with them fairly regularly throughout the school year, uh, throughout the legislative season, to figure out which school systems, not just individual schools, but which school systems have particular financial needs that need to be addressed by the legislative giving, legislature giving exemptions or addressing it with additional resources. And this is, this is how we are going to have to handle salary disparities. It's how we're gonna to have to handle the passage of school levies in different, different parts of this city you know, we might pass a school levy, but the way that the money is allocated to individual schools might need to be adjusted. So we will have to continue to work on this. We are never done. Great, so now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. One minute. One minute, yeah. And we will start with Ben. And then Clayton. Hi, Ben. Hello. Um, well, I first want to say thank you for your support for an income tax. Um, it's definitely necessary in our state. I was wondering why you support a flat rate income tax over a progressive income tax and whether you would support a capital gains tax as well. So I would not support a capital gains tax if we had a corporate income tax because I, if we had a personal income tax and a, and a corporate income tax, we would have so much revenue generated in this state that we would not need a capital gains tax. I have supported the capital gains tax as an independent source of revenue in this what I call this in between period, the interregnum, a terrible situation to be in, uh, because we need more sources of revenue and a capital gains is an excellent source of revenue. Uh, my idea for the flat tax is to address two issues. One is a constitutional issue. We currently view property taxes and income taxes as the same taxes in this state. The Constitution determines that, and the state Supreme Court says that you can't have both. But if you have a flat rate, say 6% on a whatever you pay in dollars to the federal government, that's actually a progressive tax. Because 6% on 600,000 is a heck of a lot more than 6% on none, or 6% on 5,000. Sorry. Um, when considering the nature of our four questions, which are all interrelated, yes. uh, we, it seems that we would have to consider the nature of the building climate, which is very hot, so therefore everything costs much more, and the nature of housing inflation. So my, my question is, do, do not these two considerations alone require uh, a personal income tax for the state of Washington, period. I believe they do, and that is why I believe we have to have a complete change in our tax code. The, the changing of a tax code from one that was designed to support the agrarian economy and farmers in 1889 to the tax code that emerged through the Great Depression uh, to what the economy is of Washington State today have nothing to do with each other. But we are stuck with the ones, the tax code that was developed in the 1930s. And we have to change it. And so part of adopting an income tax on both personal and corporate income would allow us to drop the sales tax appreciably, which would reduce the cost of building housing, procuring materials and supplies, and reduce the cost of every other element of our system and end this regressive pressure that is on the consumer who is poor, working, or middle income. Thank you. David. Um, <clears throat> I, I 
saw David Frock the other day, uh, and he's talking about uh, his, uh, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, Medicare for all. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, healthcare for uh, all. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, I just wondered if you have any thoughts about that uh, uh, bill, whether it has a shot, uh, uh, how you think it's constructed, if you're aware of it, if you've had a chance to read it. So I have, uh, I have supported it. I have uh, not read the current version. I put a lot of faith in Senator Frock. He does not do anything lightly. And I, I believe deeply in providing healthcare for all and having the Medicare system be the core of what becomes the healthcare system for the United States. The situation that we are in in Congress is so uh, fragile and so egregious that my objective right now is to hold on to Medicaid expansion for medical, dental, vision, and mental health care right now. I will support initiatives. I will support the discussion, the public discussion about moving towards a health care for all system, but I am going to focus on protecting Medicaid. For a couple more questions. You said you would support a health care for all initiative. What about whole Washington? Do you support that? I can't remember which one that is. It's uh, 1600. Is that the um, the health care security trust? I can't remember. Uh, no, it's like it's health care for all, Medicare for all, universal health care. Yes, I, I will sign on to and I will vote for that if the, it gets to the ballot because I have a I have a theory, a personal theory about both health care clean energy, everything related to the environment, uh, education, that you, you support every discussion that is talking about where you want to be 20 years from now, even if you can't get there right now. Because it keeps it in the public awareness, it keeps it on the agenda, it doesn't let people duck and pretend, I'll deal with it tomorrow. So I, that's why I support it. Thank you. Sir. I'm excited about your vision about investing more in higher education. Have you identified revenue sources uh, specifically to fund those investments? And if so, where do you think uh, those funds should be invested to expand access and quality? Right. So one of the reasons why I want to have the public debate about funding higher ed is so that we can start talking about how income taxes in other states are the stable source of revenue to support the funding of public education. And public education happens in early learning, it happens in K-12, and it happens in the higher ed system. That is why we have a public university and community and technical college system, in order to support public access to higher education for all of their lives. And so I can talk about stable sources of revenue and the operating budget and the general, general fund is not a stable source of revenue for higher ed. It never has been. The car tabs were our stable source of revenue until Iman killed it. And so I will look for sources of revenue in the p system as well as in other sources. Right now, capital gains tax, I would argue for that. Okay, time for one last short question. Um, thank you for passing net neutrality for Washington State. What are you doing to educate other states about how they might pass similar legislation? It's a terrific story about how there are about 17 states that had a net neutrality bill um, introduced in the legislature, but what really happened is National Council of State Legislatures, uh, NCSL, is a national body where state legislators come together. Uh, they have actually moved our bill into the forefront of the discussions for all of the national conferences this year. And so legislators are calling Representative Hansen and Representative Smith and uh, figuring out how they navigated that space with the industry partners, the stakeholders. Uh, net neutrality is, is going to determine whether or not we actually have public access to higher edu any education system, to healthcare, to supporting critical infrastructure improvements. You can't do anything in any state without access to the internet.
Thank you. Great. We're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Thank you for taking the time to continue to push us as candidates to talk about not just what we're doing and what we did, but where we're headed as a state and as a community. I am so grateful to the people of the 36th District who not only have supported me at the ballot, but they have, they have pressed me to continue to be an advocate for those who don't have a voice in this system. And for all of the work that people do coming down to Olympia, that's the voice that gives me the voice to have an impact. I really thank you. Thank you very much.